Welcome to the FIA Hockey Pro League show, where today we will be analysing and discussing the weekend's matches between India and Spain men's and women's teams. But before we start talking about the hockey, let's just watch a short video with some of a few uh, goal scoring highlights from the weekend, which I have to say uh, was probably one of the most entertaining weekends of hockey I've watched for a while. They're pulling one of the Indian players away from them and creating that personal space. Salima Tete with the goal on the reverse. Raw pace and a fine, fine finish. Salima has India back on level terms. Krishan Patak, who is not here this weekend or not playing this weekend. Karkira, what a finish that is. Johan Tarez on the upright reverse. It's an absolute rocket. Clever touch. And forward comes Segu. This, if it goes in, is phenomenal. Well, I take my hat off to you because we have seen some sensational goals in the Pro League, but this was right up there. Some goals there. I think all of us would be quite proud to uh, proud to have scored. Even the two goalkeepers on the show today. Um, so uh, I've got no idea how I'm going to keep you three guests to our uh, 30 minute program. But uh, just to give you a quick introduction, uh, sitting in the co in the co host chair is South Africa hockey legend Marsha Cox. Hi, Marsha. Hi, Sarah. Great really looking to forward to today's show. Yeah, it's been some great hockey on offer. Um, we've also got the former GB and England goalkeeper um, and now world class commentator Simon Mason. So hi, Simon. Hi, Sarah. Hi, everybody. Looking forward to chatting about what was an insane weekend of hockey at times. It really was. And still picking himself up off the ground after watching those hockey matches, we've got coaching guru and former India uh, goalkeeper Cedric D'Souza. Hi, Cedric. Hi, hi, all. Uh, let's, let's get the, the show rolling. <laughs> um, before we start talking about the matches, I've just got, I mean, those goals that we just saw in that clip, um, I mean, all three of them were fantastic, but the... Um, the, the, I mean, Bella and Iglesias, that was an amazing goal. Marsha, have you ever scored anything like that, either by accident or, uh, or for real? <laughs> I was just going to say, not intentionally, but also not by accident. So, no, I think that is a really special skill and also just to identify uh, your space that you have and just to stay calm. Yeah. I mean, Simon, as a goalkeeper, as you see that ball going over your head and just going in that top corner, what would you have been thinking at that moment? Clapping. Um, without expletives. <laughs> Clapping. Absolutely. Sometimes you just have to put a hand up and go, you know what, that's unstoppable. And yeah, um, I, yeah I mean, the momentum of Savita going through underneath the ball, and you get to the point where you go, there is just nothing you can do. And sometimes you won't reflect on it in that moment, but sometimes you look at stuff back on replay and go, well, you know what, if someone's going to do that to me, then so be it. That's pretty, well, it's just insanely good. Yeah, it really was. Um, and actually, I mean, the other goal from uh, Juan uh, Taras, I mean, Cedric, that looked like a um, a very casually taken goal. But actually, we all know the skill involved in hitting that ball on the move in that upright position with that precision. That's quite incredible, isn't it? It takes a lot of dexterity. It takes presence of mind. And the most important thing is the uh, the quickness in the hit, which beat the goalkeeper. You know, we always think about hitting it with power. But it's the quickness which actually beats the keeper. Ah, Simon and me, the two old men who they're hanging around and saying, yeah, we get beaten with that kind of a ball which gets in. Quickness is the most important thing, more than actually power times. So that was really yeah, because, a great, I mean, great movement by moving to the circle, you know, getting an upright position, opening up his shoulders and hitting that ball on the, on the rise. Absolutely yeah. brilliant. Totally unexpected as well. Um, but um, just talking about the two women's matches that we saw, first of all, um, India won the first match 2-1 uh, with India's goals coming for Jyoti and uh, Neha. And then Spain, um, they, they had the, the sole goal from Marta Segu. Um, and then we had an absolute cracker of a game uh, that ended 4-3 to Spain uh, with one of the most audacious goals you'll see. Um, Marsha, um, both matches were very, very close. But day two had some moments that will stand out in the memory. What are your overall thoughts of those two performances? I think um, just reflecting back on both the games, and like you say, they were really close. Um, I think the biggest lessons for both teams were, were just the clinic, being clinical on the few opportunities that you'll get. Because while, you, you know, in the second game, we definitely saw Spain dominate, or even actually in the first game, we saw them actually have a lot of the game, but then they were just not clinical in their, in their finishing, which let them down. 
Um, and then you see that then change in the second game. And then uh, equally, India would have been a bit disappointed that maybe they weren't as clinical as they were um, going from game one to game two. So I think that that is probably one of the biggest standouts for me is um, in games like this where um, it doesn't really matter how much you dominate the game between the 225s, the opportunities you get in the circle count the most. And those are the ones that you've got to, you've got to convert um, where we look, uh, I think, I think it was the second Spanish game where they had so, no, the, sorry, the first Spanish, the first game Spain had so many circle entries and very few shots on goal, actually. So when, when you actually look at it in, in that regard, they'd be disappointed that they weren't even converting their circle entries into, into a chance. Mm -hmm. um, so those are big takeouts for me that at this level, you know, you, you, that's where, where it counts the most. And that's where you really have to be probably as, in, as composed as Iglesias, but for 60 minutes of the game <laughs> and not just one moment. <laughs> Yeah, I agree. Um, Cedric, what, what improvements or changes uh, did you did you see um, between the first and the second game? And now I know India lost the second game, but did you see some improvements and changes between game one and game two that Yannicka Shopman might have really um, asked of her team? I think definitely. I think although India won the first match, I think she played a better second game in terms of more pressure on the ball. Uh, we all know that the Spanish midfield is the strength of that team in terms of the and, the and the midfield gave them far too much space in the first game in terms of not pressure on the ball. And, you know, when they get into the 23, they're clinical, they're precise. And so try and avoid the feeder route. That was the most important thing. And I think in the second game, they did that. But then there were some brilliant moves, which, you know, this makes what hockey makes. It makes hockey in terms of getting a win or getting a win or getting a loss. But I think the most important thing, India came back from a kind of a lackadaisical press into a higher press in the second match. Mm. Yeah. And you talk, Cedric, you were talking about um, the differences from pressure on the ball that, that India made, but also on the, the flips. Um, Simon, be also interesting to hear your thoughts on, on Spain, because they really maintained a high um, tempo in the game, in both games, actually. And um, in the first game, we definitely know that they were probably smothered a little bit more um, around, around the ball and, and a bit less in, in the second game so that they could take advantage of, of their chances. What is your take on the Spanish woman from game one to game two? I think there was there was more energy and there was more tempo. I think they, they also handled the ball a bit better in terms of their turnover rate was lower. I think the first game I was I was critical on comms that it felt like it was turnover, turnover. One team won the ball and then they went straight back down the same channel. I think game two, it felt they, they, they're both sides, but Spain, if we, we were focusing on them, they, they moved the ball better away from congestion. They have got pace. They have got some really good individual skill sets, similarly with India. And when they were running back into groups of players, once they turned it over, I don't think that plays very well into either of their, their strengths. So... As the weekend progressed, I think there was a, a greater awareness that they could play at different tempos. It wasn't just about increasing the tempo for the entire game. Yes, I think they're more effective when they when they press higher, when they are more effective, more uh, aggressive. But by stepping away and altering the channels that they work down, I thought there was a better use of all of the space across the pitch as opposed to on the Saturday match. You could pretty much cut away the left hand attacking channel for either side. It, it wasn't used particularly effectively. So. I think there was more use of all the space and then there was just less turnover. Yeah, I'd agree with that. Um, talking about just um, one player in particular, um, and she's impressed me in, in all four of Spain's matches now, and that's Gigi Oliver. Um, she just seems to be such an integral part of the Spanish team. Um, and this week, obviously, she was celebrating 250 caps. Um, Marsha, this is a question for you, really, as, as, a, as the person who's played most recently out of, the, out of the panelists. How inspirational is it um, when you know that someone who's integral to your team is celebrating a milestone? How, how inspirational is it to the other team members to perhaps up their game that little bit more almost in recognition of, of that player within the team? Is that very much a psychological thing? I think it is a psychological thing um, amongst teams in general, but I think I just wanted to talk about Gigi in, in particular and how much she means for the Spanish team because um, her whole career, she's been pretty much a pivotal part of this team. She's been the midfielder that sort of controlled the game for many years. Um, and I think that as this team has transformed from um, great successes and also really disappointing results in, in the years, I think, of like 
between 2012 and, and 2015, uh, somewhere there. She's also been really important in, in the regrouping and refocusing and, and that new direction that and the new course that the Spanish women's team has taken. Um, we've seen her take control at really key moments in, in final, in semifinals at a World Cup or, or um, other major events. So I think, you know, in general, a, a milestone is a big event for teams. Um, so, and they always want to uh, lift their game to, yeah, to make that celebration even that much more special uh, for, for the player achieving that. But I think for a player like Gigi, who means so much, not just to this team, but also to Spanish hockey, I think that then it's it's even more it's it's an additional motivation that you're not just doing it for for one person that that really epitomizes uh, what what we see with that Spanish hockey where you talk about the energy that they bring. I think that she's at the at the front line leading them um, with she's controlling that game. I think that she's she's also off the field a very sociable person that is just the binding. You know she she pretty much but glues that team together on and off the field. Um, and yeah, I think that then when it comes to somebody that is that is almost that big for the team and the the, the sport, it gives them even more motivation to make that that milestone special for her. Yeah, because I mean, she's not the biggest person, but she's the biggest no. <laughs> personality and the biggest presence as well. And, and of course, she comes from Spanish hockey royalty, doesn't she? You know, there's a there's a, there's a lot of Olivers in the uh, in, in Spanish um, dynasty. Um, just just moving back to the um, to the Indian team for a minute, Cedric. Um, the, the goals from Sanjita and Teta Salima um, underlined the danger that um, India pose when they run at defenders. Um, and I'm getting the sense just from listening to some of the, um, the, the post-match interviews and the halftime interviews with Janneke Shopman and also from speaking to her myself, that she's trying to encourage her team to make more decisions and to have the confidence to run at defenders to a far greater degree. Is that something that you'd agree with? And are we seeing it if that's the case? Well, 100%. I think, you know, look at the strength of India. She can go one-on-one. -on -one. The most important thing, she can drive and she's fit and she can go through uh, at pace. I didn't... They didn't do it at a regular, uh, regularly. They did it intermittently. Then you've got to keep the pressure on all the time in terms of that because they've got a fantastic uh, bunch of girls who can actually run for the entire match. So the bench strength is strong and the pace is strong. So how do you manage that? How do you manage that in terms of pushing harder and harder in terms of getting the opposition under pressure? And the strength on the ball, this, both the goals were strength on the ball and also... In the on the baseline, through a host of defenders, keeping the ball on the stick, fighting a way through, and putting the ball through and for a tip in. So the question is, when you have that strength in the ball, use it. So you know, make that make that your kind of mantra with this team that you know you have the strength, use it. Yeah, and I think as sorry, I was just before you start, Marsha, I was just going to say, um, I think that's something we're going to see hopefully more and more from the Indian side because they. The, the capabilities there, isn't it? It's just it's just persuading the players to, uh, to to come out with those skills. Sorry, Marsha, you were going to say. Yeah, I was just going to say it's actually really nice and refreshing to see um, these types of attacks from an Indian team that are traditionally also really strong um, as a defensive unit. We know that their defense is something that is traditionally uh, the hardest thing for for most opposition. They're really physical, um, and they would, uh, you know, what we spoke about earlier about smothering the ball carrier. That is something that you would normally traditionally see um, in, India, in an Indian style of play, but to see them now change that mindset into attack, it's really refreshing and I think quite exciting. But speaking about attacks and <laughs> goal scoring, uh, we do need to go back to the Spanish uh, goal that Iglesias goal that we touched on on earlier Simon do you think that this is also just um we it takes goals like this to start trends and change the way strikers train and skill sets that they start adding to their game so you spoke about you would just clap your hands as a goalkeeper if somebody scored a goal like this are you hoping we see more play like this and more intentional fantastic goals like the Iglesias goal? Of course I'm hoping we see more like that because it makes us I said as a goalkeeper all you can do is, is applaud and it excites us in 
in commentary and it means that the, the pictures that are beamed out around the world will hopefully as we move forward watched in stadiums even more are applauded for the, the skill that we see um and we all want to see that but my i think the the, the choice that was made by Bellin to execute that skill is the difference and that's what means that we see goals like that i, th I think you've got players around the world standing on fields in an uncontested space lobbing goalkeepers and backhand scoring into top corners and those skills exist across our game because they are being practiced by young players old players whatever they are the difference is that in that moment she was able to execute something because she knew what she wanted to do and that to me is the difference between your average everyday saturday afternoon player in an international it's not do they have the skill it's can they execute it under pressure in a pro league with an advancing goalkeeper and that's where we then get to see that so for me i i want to see it so the answer to your question is yes of course i want to see every single ridiculous goal that we can possibly imagine at all times to make the competition as exciting as possible but the reason that i think we will get to see it is that players are becoming more adept mentally it's not about how fast they can run or how fast they can move their stick it's about the decisions the choices that they make the passes that they, they can see and they can visualize and that mental training and application that we now hear about when we do the interviews with the coaches and things and we also then see is is the difference and that's why i think we'll we will get to see it more and more and more it's like the choice that the belgium i'll use the belgian men made to to start experimenting with overhead passes and now we're seeing it in the, the Belgian ladies team. And now we're seeing it replicated across some lots of other uh, situations. But we'll see Bellin's goal and want to try it. And it's then whether they have the composure and mental um, aspects to be able to execute it successfully. Yeah, I think so, another thing is, the, sorry, the other thing is that, you know, you look at defences, they're becoming really stronger and tighter and tighter. So how do strikers then try and get that edge over a defence, which is, you know, so you're thinking, you have a thinking gap on, all the time, try to figure out the minute spaces that can be exploited and how in that little space, how do you execute a skill? So for me, that was absolutely brilliant. I mean, you know, yeah, uh, Simon, apart from applauding, we could take a hats off to the, into the girl who said, score that goal, it was brilliant, you know? So it's the presence of mind in a, in, in a pressure situation. It's the receiving of that ball, the first touch received. And then it's the deftness and the dexterity to lift that ball over the keeper. I mean, yeah, <laughs> top class. It, it definitely makes, it definitely takes coaching to a different level because mm -hmm. these, you know, we could, we change the way a coach would say, ensure that your body position is good so that you can receive the ball properly. And then you know what you're going to do next when actually you, you almost need to also coach players to know what they're going to do next because maybe you don't need to receive the ball cleanly. And, and and use these aerial skills and especially with aerial skills you you need to be able to adapt from a bounce of a ball that you might not be able to uh train always because it it bound, might might bounce differently but you got to be able to stay composed and and react uh very quickly so i really like um what you both have said about about the adaption and the ability to use these skills. And it would also be interesting, you know, uh, especially Cedric as, as a coach, doesn't it also just make coaching that much more challenging a bit because you can't go back and say, well, uh, Bellin, you didn't receive the ball properly, but <laughs> for me, Marsh, what a goal. <laughs> the, the big problem is going to come for all those, uh, all those coaches of junior teams where the kids want to do a Bellin goal before they want to actually learn how to hit the ball into the goal. That's going to be yeah. the, uh, the big challenge. Um, we spoke a lot about goals. We've celebrated goals quite rightly. Uh, but I think we're just going to have a quick look now at some of the clips of the uh, goalkeepers and the, and the saves that took place over the weekend as well. The drive forward down. They try and take free hits early. They're trying to make their way into the circle. Good save, Savita. Left foot in against Lucia Jimenez. I love it. Juggle in and then on onto the backhand. Oh, that's such a better counter-attack, but... And it is Shannon Lacra. What a save. What a save that is. That's a great big extended left foot. I'll have that. Thank you very much. They've switched sides. Harman Pre offloads. Dips it Turkey. Lifts it. Well saved on the line. Save that. Wide. 
What a pick that is. Absolute genius. I think Nacho Rodriguez has just picked an absolute <laughs> blinder. That goal by um, Mario Garin, where he's just stuck his leg out like that. I mean, how did he not pull his hamstring in the first instance? But that was that was quite a special save, wasn't it? Yeah, I think Dan, who was leading the commentary at that point with me, he said this as, as I went into my absolute raptures, said that there is the chairman, president and paid up <laughs> member of the goalkeepers union. Um, you've, you had to look at that in terms of the athleticism that he demonstrated. There, there has to be a composure. Quite often in that situation, you'll find a goalkeeper will, will rush out and go to ground and then uh, field play can then go round that static situation. By standing on his feet, he gave himself maximum mobility. But what was the best bit of the whole thing for me is that if you watch, there's no collapse, there's no weight going backwards, which is really technical. That's when you limit your your sideways movement. If your body weight is going back into your into your padded shorts, basically there's no extension sideways. And he kept everything forwards and saw it completely, drove off the right side, the whole right side of his body to get such a long extension. He's not a particularly tall goalkeeper if we think about some of the other international men that we see and to get that extension. And you could see from the, from the capture, from where his foot went down, that there was just no anticipation of that amount of stretch. So mm. consequently, I just thought the athleticism he demonstrated with his ability to get his body weight down to the ground, driving it sideways, was just a fabulous demonstration of, of mobility and flexibility. Yeah. And then, of course, there's the bravery of Rodriguez on the line afterwards uh, for a different, it was obviously a different save. But you'd want someone like that there behind you, wouldn't you? Well, I'm sure Cedric and I have played in teams that <laughs> both we have, have played with defenders who would do it and defenders who definitely wouldn't do it. Um, so... <laughs> That, that kind of team defence, and you're talking about scrambled saves, was it pretty? No. But was it effective? Yes. And to my mind, it goes back a little bit to, to, to Bellin's goal, is that you've got hand-eye coordination that allows you to perform that sort of function. Most average Saturday afternoon players, maybe they're standing there, but they would almost try and do too much. They'd almost try and play it, play away at it. The, the stick would be coming up, up and across the line of the ball. And to be able to execute it under pressure at that moment in time, stepping forwards and keeping your eye on the ball, so being brave, is just a combination of all of those facets that makes our international athletes now just so, yeah, just so exceptional in terms of what they execute in different areas of the pitch. But as a goalkeeper, you absolutely want to look behind you, having the ball gone over the top of you, and realise that somebody's there and battered it off the line. Another thing about the goalkeeper who uh, Spanish goalkeeper who extended his left foot out so brilliantly and got that save. I think you must under, always understand that one of the Indian players always feel that when they come into the goalkeeper's, what they call strong side because of the stick, they try and cut towards the goalkeeper's, the, you know, the padded side to the left-hand side. So uh, he, in, in a defensive kind of mode, you kind of give that fake space that they're going, letting him go to the left, and then you just extend your leg out, boom, and get that ball. Yeah, it's, it's absolutely brilliant. And, you know, as Simon says very rightly, the balance was incredible. Because if he was slightly off balance, the foot would not have got. He wouldn't have got that ball. It was absolutely brilliant. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll stick with you, Cedric, for a minute. Um, that we saw two fantastic games, but I wonder if we could just talk about the first game and India's performance in that because they went four-one down. Um, I can't imagine that Graham Reid was particularly happy about that. But then, obviously, they came back um, to five-four. What, what was your what was your take on that game? And what was what on earth was happening in that Indian side to to allow first of all that deficit and then and then to come back like that? Well, I think the most important thing in, in the beginning it was they didn't track the ball enough. They were not cutting down the lines. High press was not in actual uh, in 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 the game right from the beginning. It was only the latter part when they really came into it, and that's the time when you found the intense pressure, which led to easy turnovers. Uh, in the midfield, and that's what they exploited because they've got the space and they've got the speed up front. And I think they were punished with the short corners and the rebounds, basically. I think when you look at that, it's the intensity and the pressure on the ball which actually made India get back into that game. And 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 with the, with the kind of pressure that was coming on the Spanish team, they kind of gave the ball away very easily. It was soft turnovers, and they were punished on that. And you always yeah. realize one thing, it's only over till when the final whistle goes. You just keep at it. It's four seconds to go. You got a goal. And that's, for the purists, it was a fantastic game. For the Spaniards, ah, it would be one which they've lost again, like they lost against England uh, when they were in the last minute. They've lost the second game. India had this in the past in terms of conceding goals in the end. 
they seem to be in the other in the driver's seat now, where they're not conceding goals and they're scoring goals. And let's yeah. hope uh, both teams learn from it. Yes, as you were talking about that, how Spain would have been disappointed. We've heard of the 2-0 trap, but I don't think we've ever heard of the 4-1 trap, Simon. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think uh, were the big um, areas that needed to change from game one to game two for Spain? Bizarrely, I don't actually think they needed to change very much other than the ball handling in the last 10 minutes and an understanding of playing India in India. Um, I understand the 2-0 trap, Marsha. Uh, yeah. In India, there's no such thing as 2-0. 3-0, 4-0, 5-0. I stood there and culturally stand, stood behind a team watching India suddenly click a switch that you don't... Well, I say you don't experience it. You, you used to experience it with Pakistan and Pakistan. And you, you have two teams there with a cultural identity that is all about speed and counter-attack and skill that has been now developed on. Don't get me wrong, they aren't one-dimensional, but there is an inherent belief that when they get on the front foot and they become a, a dominant, running, energised team, you have to almost play them at their own game and you have to work the ball into space and then you have to try and play as far away from your own goal as possible, which is really difficult when you it looks like you're playing against extra men. And I think what, what Spain did is they, they believed in what they did um, to create that, that 4-1 lead. They were, they were good for it and India were a little bit hesitant at times. And then the clock just went backwards for them and they were looking at a clock that was counting down in slow motion and everything that when you're on when when you get a little bit of belief and that's what the indian team showed with 10 minutes to go is they had that belief and they said right we can just create more and that more is in every single element of what they do we will run more we will trap more we will pass more we will create more chances and and then you execute it and everything goes together and i think spain then learned about that in in the second game and they just handled the ball that little bit better and they, you you take away that ability to create an emotional pressure by handling the ball in a more meaningful manner. And it's tiny margins, Marsha, you know, you know this, you've played in games where you go, how did we lose that? Or how did we win that? And it comes down to a moment of emotional and mental dominance as much as it is about how much you run and how well you handle the ball. So that to me was the difference is they just manage the game better. Yeah, I was just thinking that as you were saying that, that then it becomes more a mental game and your preparation is more about your mental preparation for the game as opposed to your, your physical preparation, um, managing and controlling the phases of the game. It yeah, just and the, the final... Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry just, the, just one tiny technical thing. And the, the example of that is that when a team puts you under pressure, if you're the central midfielder of the team being put under pressure, you lead back towards the ball to try and offer a, an easy pass. But in yeah. doing so, you condense the space and you allow the opponent to press. Yes. The bravery is you actually almost have to lead the other way yeah. and you have to extend and expand the space. And so it is, it's completely mental. These sides train for pretty much full time. Their, their physical capacity and skill base is identical, but it's who is the bravest to go, you know what, we're under pressure and I'm going to run the other way to yeah. stretch it out and ask some alternative questions. So it's a mental thing. And the other thing is also once you receive the ball is to try and reposition as quickly as possible so that you get into another another zone which creates an opening again. So we tend to see players when they are under pressure mentally, they get blocked and they stay, they don't move. And when you don't move and you don't reposition, you're falling into the opposition strap. I was just going to say as well, Cedric, I mean, you spoke earlier about the the, the um, sort of isolated mistakes that Spain gradually began to allow to creep into their game. The more they happen and the more the opposition has flicked the switch of, of self-belief, the bigger those mistakes become, don't they? And uh, I just wondered, all, all three of you, I mean, we, we saw it in the second game. Um, Spain had the lead. But I don't know about you guys watching, but certainly I was watching thinking, are they going to do exactly the same again? That has to have been going through their heads. Would you rather have been, I'll get, come to each of you in turn, would you rather have been India chasing the game or Spain defending that lead? What, what would have been the, you know, which of those positions would you rather have taken? And I'll come to you first, Cedric, on that. I think it doesn't matter whichever side you're in. Basically, it's a question of how do you maintain your balance and composure, whether you're in the, you know, whether you're in the lead or whether you're, you know, uh, in, the opposite, in the losing portion of the game. The most important thing is how do you maintain your equilibrium and your balance? And how do you stick to your game plan right through with putting pressure on the ball. I keep saying that because I think pressure on the ball is probably the most important thing where you create mistakes on the opposite, make the opposition make some mistakes. And then you you, um, you you force them to make mistakes, you force them into certain corners, and then you use your your strength, which is 
uh, both teams have got the 3D skills. Both teams got the space, uh, the pace, sorry, to get into and beat the 1v1. So basically, I think from an, from an aspect of whether you're in a, uh, losing a game or winning a game, it's the question of how you maintain your balance right through with your, your strengths, playing to your strengths, which is most important. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Simon, you were obviously watching that game. What, 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 what did you make? Did, did you, did you feel that um, India were going to do it on that second occasion? Um, in, in principle, you felt that they could. Uh, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna go with a bit of a, a reality check against Cedric's philosophy and his philosophical answer. In principle, no, I'll have, a, I'll have a one 0 lead. But I've got to try and defend. Thank you very much. I'm not going to say I'm more comfortable <laughs> to chase a game. I'll take the winning position. Thank you very much. Yeah. And work on <laughs> work on work on sensible defence and some decent goalkeeping. Yeah. Um, which is, I think that's. I think we'd all put a slightly bigger bet on that as as well. Sorry, I would put a slightly bigger bet on that than having to chase a game and watching the clock roll away from you. So yes, you felt that India could, but I have felt that India could for twenty years of international isn't a single game that I've ever watched them play with 10 minutes to go when they get on the front foot that you think they couldn't. So there's an identity to that. There's some teams that you think, well, they're not going to chase that down because they don't have the ability. Um, but you've only got to watch back across the last 50, certainly 15 years of international hockey to see that teams on the front foot with a little bit of momentum are very, very hard to stop. But I'll still take a winning position to start with, with, with five minutes to go. <laughs> well, I think I think before we get this, I think it's got to understand why did India kind of lose this match in terms of, you know, just look at it. She conceded nine goals in these two games. Out of these nine goals, seven were penalty corner goals. Seven. So the question is, was their first wave as dominant as it normally is when Amit Rohidas is there on the pitch. Because for me, he's probably the best first wave in the world in running out. He's brilliant. He gets all the balls in that. But with Manpreet doing what he did, there were plenty of goals that went through. Although Manpreet is, um, is really a good, a good first wave, he's not an Amit Rohidas. So for me, the most important thing was the first wave being critical in terms of getting that ball. Seven PC goals. And you're losing out your game changer. I always say there are some people who are game changers. Whether it be, we look at a game changer only in winning, but we look at a game changer who can also save those goals for you in terms of that. So I think that was where India kind of came, came a cropper. Mm. We're going to have to wrap up there, but I'm just going to ask, um, well, all, all three of you, but I'll start with Marsha. Um, what will Graham, well, you actually, Max Calders, let's go to Max Calders because he's someone you'll know. <laughs> what will he have taken away from this weekend? And uh, um, will his blood pressure have come down from Saturday's match quite nicely <laughs> by this stage? I'm sure he's had many uh, cans of cola <laughs> to, <laughs> drink to calm his nerves. But yeah, I, um, I think just looking even further back, um, I think that he'd be quite pleased with the progress that they made um, from game one to game two. We spoke about uh, the mentality that change that they would have need to, to have made in staying composed and understanding to how to control the phases and when they are in control to really try and stretch those moments for as long as possible. Um, I think that he'd be quite pleased with the progress that, that his team has made, but um, you know, there are always um, areas that you need to improve on. And I think that that 4-1 is going to be the, the that 4-1 lead that they let slip is going to probably be something that they would carry with them for a lot longer, um, yeah. as most of the learnings could come from there. Yeah. Um, Simon, A.D. Locke, I mean, he it was his birthday weekend. Uh, he got his first win in the Pro League. He's going to be a pretty happy guy, isn't he? I would imagine so, with the exception of uh, the, the first day result, obviously. And I think there's some really, really good signs in that Spanish side. I, th I think they're developing well as a unit. I think they've got some good um, individuals. I, I actually think their distribution was better coming out the back. I mean, it's a concern I have for the Indian ladies is how well their distribution out the back, how good their distribution is. I think they struggle at times. Whereas I think with, with Spain, it was, a, it was a stronger platform to build from. So, yeah, I, I think you'd be reasonably pleased going away from this weekend. Brilliant. And Cedric, I'm going to ask you to do a double shift here. Graham Reed and Yannicka Shopman, are they are they happy, medium, moderately happy, or not so happy at the end of this weekend? Well, I think they can they can look. The Pro League is is a, is the opportunity to to test uh, and blood young players, and and that's what they're trying to do to find what are the most important players for the World Cup coming up. And I think from you know, winning and losing is part of the game, of course, because you are with India, you want to win everything. But the question is. 
I think from their perspective, they're looking at the players who will actually be the core for the World Cup coming up so they can go, yeah, even in losing part of the whole situation. Brilliant. We're going to finish up with um, a moment of the week, uh, which, I, well, we'll all enjoy. It's India coming back from uh, being 4-1 uh, down to Spain. But I'd just like to extend my thanks to all three of you. Great chat with you. Uh, Cedric, Marsha, Simon, thank you so much for spending the time with us today. Um, and now we'll head over to the moment of the week. That's a dreadful pass though from Gonzalez. Chilinand, Mandy, and save, Akash deep, and then it's finished off by Chilinand Lakra, bouncing the ball home, offering hope to India. It was scored in messy fashion. Valen Kumar it is, and it's in. It's very, very good indeed through Mario Gadian. It's all square at fours. Out and trapped, absolutely dead. He picks it and rips it round his body. Harman Preet against Gowden. And Harman Preet makes it 5-4. India have snatched it by the odd goal in nine.